and this is Tammy Katz, Chair of the Requirement Working Group. We're going to go ahead and get started on day three of our session. We've got about 22 participants on the line so far, and then probably a few more will be joining us. Occasionally, I'll check the chat just for comments as well. And we do put the transcripts and the recordings up, and I'll, I'll show you guys where those are. For our agenda, this is where we're at today. We're going to talk about our new guide for needs and requirements development and management, and I'm going to share that session. We do have a kind of open discussion for about an hour and a half. It may take the whole time, may not, but we wanted to allow the participation of the different working group members. Before I go into the guide introduction, I'm going to share with each of you how to get to the Connect site. And when you log in to Encozy, you'll be able to get the links to the Connect site. If you try and do that without logging in, it may not recognize you as an Encozy member. And so that's how your permission are based. So once you're logged in, if you've not bookmarked the site already, like I tend to do up here, then we're going to have you navigate to there. I'm going to put a link to it in the chat and I will send that to everybody. So when you are on the Encozy site, if you would like to just take a moment to understand that there's this collaboration connect portal up here. When you connect on that, you get to these series of SharePoint sites. And when you do that, you can go hunt under working groups and find requirements. So I'm not going to take any more time, but that's how you navigate there directly. And then also I put it in the chat. So once you're here, you can find our sessions at IW 2021. You can and also find pages for our manual and our guidelines. Those are our working pages. So we'll post drafts. We might have discussion notes. We might have review inputs. The teams that are working as contributors will tend to go on there for information. However, that doesn't preclude anyone else from seeing what's on there. You're definitely welcome to go and look. We have drafts of these documents on those pages, but we also put a copy on our sessions for IW 2021. This is where you'll find our session recordings, you'll find links to slide packages. I also put the full set of cap needs up here for you. And that's from our first day. I also have a document library down here. This is just where all the documents are being stored if you just want to go down there directly. So hopefully that was a useful walkthrough for you. I'm going to go ahead and get back to the slides now. But we're going to go ahead uh, for the first session today and talk about our newest guideline and it's gone through some name changes. So I'm actually going to talk about that as well, because it's quite a, a long name. And I am looking for a little bit more of a catchier name for it. We've been respecting that it is needs and requirements over the last several days. It's been a theme for us. Original name of it was Guide for Developing and Managing Requirements. And Kevin Orr was the product lead for the last year. Kevin has decided to stand by to be more of a contributor. And I'm going to take over as product lead starting now at IW. And he's done a really great job working with some of the folks on gathering some material and starting a draft. So we're going to go through that today. Unfortunately, Kevin couldn't be with us due to work commitments. This is, again, our product family. We've talked about our needs and requirements lifecycle manual. We've talked about our guide to verification and validation yesterday. Today, we're going to talk about this other new product. So highlighting the manual again, this is the foundational piece that really a lot of our new material is going into. We spent a whole session on day one on this, a little bit of an overview on that yesterday. I encourage you to check that material out if you weren't here with us. The idea here is we're going to provide a lot more about the what should be done and why. Why should it be done in the manual? It's really rich with a lot of information and, and lessons learned and some new nomenclatures, some new concepts. This was originally our guide. We were putting this together as a guideline. Last year, we realized it was so large, many people may not choose to use it as a guide, they may shy away from it because it had a lot in it. So we split that out. We made a manual and Lou Weecraft has been product lead and he uh, author on that. And now we're still recognizing the need for guidelines and practitioners who just need some guidance. Where do I start? What's a good series of things to look at first? What should be my step to actually apply some of what's in this manual? So that's really where we came up with, we still need guidelines. They just need to be a little more targeted focus. They need to definitely be aligned with the manual and aligned with the content. 
they shouldn't try to explain a lot of new concepts. They should align completely with the concepts. Then they need to be very specific and concise in terms of some steps to follow. And we're actually going to talk about this today because one of the things I do is I have a little bit of options on how we can format some of this and how we can present this material. So I'm going to show you what's been done to date and use this as an opportunity to gather some inputs before we continue on. I'm going to specifically talk about the guideline to needs and requirements development and management. And that is quite a lot to say. Don't even like the acronym. There's a draft, a Word document on the Connect site, and I'm even going to bring it up in a little bit. Again, originally it was called Guide to Developing and Managing Requirements. A little more of an easier title. Then we said, no, we've got to focus on needs. That's really important. So we don't want to just say requirements. We want to say needs and requirements. We want to tell people that first part of the manual where we talk about how to elicit, how to, I would say, allocate, how to develop how to manage it then once you have it. We want to give people practical guidance on that. And then yesterday, I know we flipped the script. We talked about the guide to verification and validation, which was more of a focus on system of interest in design, verification and validation. We are going to put how to verify and validate needs and requirements in this guide that I'm talking about today, because it really is formulative about how you develop and manage these is to also assess their quality and assess whether they are the right set of needs and requirements. So we put it in with this material. Go ahead. While you're on this slide, I want to point out that through the evolution of the guide and the manual, a lot of the contributor inputs, the papers, some initial text that was written for the original guide, that is all now in the manual because that piece of the guide actually turned into part one of the manual because a lot of concept kind of stuff is probably more appropriate to the manual. So they may not see stuff in the abbreviated form in the guide as directly contributable as they would see their contributions in the manual. It's a really good point, Lou. We definitely want to pay honor to all the work that's been done by our contributors. These were some of the main ones that Kevin has worked with. And I would say that a lot of their original material don't seem as reflected in the guideline now. And in fact, the guideline looks rather riddled down. So what we may do is we're going to look at the 20%. It's about 20%. I think I'm being generous on that. When I look at it again, it's probably a little less that I would say done. Uh, it's got a lot in there. It's just not exactly in the concise manner by which we think a guide could be presented. The work of integrating with the manual has also been occurring. And I'm going to show you how this guideline has proposed to integrate with the manual. And it's a slightly different way than the VNV guideline was doing it. And I think I left that purpose in IW. I wanted to actually show both of these guidelines. I'd love to see if either approach appeals to folks better. If they find that we are needing to be consistent with the guidelines and they like one approach more than the others, that's part of the discussion feedback we're going to be interested in seeing. If it doesn't matter, as long as there's a guideline and it talks to the manual, we don't care what the, if they're different, that, that's good to know too. I don't want to falsely constrain Raymond with the work he's doing on his guideline, but as part of this discussion, we're going to talk about what works well and what may not work as well. I'm still planning on releasing this this summer. There is enough content out there we can pull together to a guideline. Now it's just a matter of how we're going to structure it. So that's very feasible to have something in a releasable state by this summer. We are tying so close to the manual. The manual is in such great shape. We're going to use your feedback and, and continue to mature it, but that will help us understand pertinent points to make in the guideline. So I don't know how readable this does come on your screen, but this was a figure that got put together that kind of talks about the different requirement working group guides. The original idea of the manual is actually here. So we'll be updating these figures. I, mean, I still think the needs and requirements lifecycle manual encompasses all of this. And then what we have then is a guide for writing requirements that's already been released and we'll be fine tuning it to take out some material that are now going to be in the other guides. We heard yesterday from Raymond about the guide to verification and validation. And that one is really going to focus on design and system BNV. So these statements in here, needs and requirements, we're actually going to take those out of this, this graphic. And then the guide to developing and managing requirements, I'll talk to you about the name in a second, but the idea is it's going to go over the needs development process, design input requirements development process, and then ultimately how we manage all of that data. This is a point where I just love to spend a moment and get your thoughts. If you want to brainstorm some ideas or share some thoughts with me, I'm not 
loving this acronym <laughs> and this name does not roll off the tip of the tongue. I'm hoping that some of you who are probably a little better at this than I can help us guide. What, what should we call this thing? I don't want to lose the needs and requirements. I don't want to lose the concept behind developing and management, but I also want something with a little more condensed title than what we're carrying today. If you have ideas throughout this talk or if something occurs to you, put it in the chat or you can unmute and share it with me. I'd love to hear it. So Tammy, I guess the one question I would have is why a guide that is a sub part of the manual that you need to then keep synchronized with the manual if there were changes and not just the manual itself. That's a really good point. And were you with us last year at IW perhaps when we no, were- No, I do not believe okay. I was. Let me highlight for you why we ended up evolving to this strategy. It was a deep set of conversations last year when we did produce, actually remember originally we had the guide for writing requirements and it's a very well used guide. It's not overly long. People write classes around this guide. We have software tools that help uh, work quality checks against this guide. So we already have this construct of a guide. So when we started developing the other two guides, what we noted was they were really, really large. And the idea was, well, you can't tell people how to do something without explaining why it is we're doing it and what is the big picture we need to do. We traded the idea of, well, let's just do a manual then and put all this together in the manual. Then what we had is a lot of our requirement working group practitioners say, no, this guide for writing requirements is so incredibly useful. We still need to understand how to do something. And the biggest reason people were shying away from the material we presented last year was how lengthy it was. So you got a choice. We either whittle all that information, toss it out, and make these really discrete guides where we don't explain anything. Or you come up with something rather large where we explain a lot and people don't get practical application out of there. So we thought, well, let's make a family of products of guides, continuing on our guide for writing requirements. Let's ensure we keep them crisp, 50 pages max, checklists, templates, concept, things they should think about or question what they should do. We were picturing tables, maybe some examples. The guides that we are presenting with you today don't look like that. And I will admit fully that our manual has been the focus, but we still intend to produce that really condensed, here's how you can apply these things to the community. If we find that the double booking concept gets away from us, we might find a little more electronic means of keeping this information synergized, kind of like the CBOC. But right now, we're going to try this idea of the product family. I think the manual is, however, our showpiece. That's the big thing that we're trying to push out. And we'd like to keep the guidelines for the practitioners to help them. I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. So this is the original outline that I got from Kevin when he provided it to me. I also noticed the table of contents in the outline don't exactly align, but this matches that figure I just showed you. And so picture something that's about 50 pages max, has some checklists or tables that talk about key things you should be doing, and ultimately points to the manual for a little bit more of an explanation. In a way, we're thinking of the guides as a gateway to the manual. Some people who might be a little intimidated by the manual will get some concepts out of these guides that'll ultimately make them want to go look at the manual a little bit and understand a little bit more about why. The idea here then is we're gonna have a section that really talks about this product family and how they interact with each other in the intent of this material. We're gonna talk about then the needs development process. One of the formulative new concepts we're really starting to advocate for is don't just jump to the requirements, understand what problem you're trying to solve first. And then we get to some samples. What do needs look like? How, how could you elicit them? We'll get to the requirements development process, then how you transform those needs to a set of requirements. We talked yesterday during the guide to BNV about using some examples that resonate with real common folks. So it's not domain specific. We're starting to use coffee and coffee maker examples. And we infuse a little bit about sample needs associated with coffee. And then we start bringing in requirements associated with meeting those needs. And then we talk about how to manage that stuff. 
What he doesn't have on here that I'll be adding in is the V&V &V aspect. And when he started putting this together, we were still debating which guide it fits in best. And I think I loved what Raymond presented yesterday, which was kind of split the V up a, a bit. What you're doing earlier when you're verifying your need statements and you're validating your need statements is you're really speaking to that one picture I think Lou showed where you're checking the quality of the statements you have and then you're also checking how well aligned they are to the, what the customers and stakeholders are seeking to solve. And then with the requirements piece of it, most of us are much more familiar with that idea of checking our core requirement quality because the guide for uh, writing requirements really speaks to that with characteristics and attributes. And then the requirement validation, again, points you back to those original stakeholder needs or objectives. So we're going to add more of that in here because that will help you understand if your needs and your requirements set is is something worth continuing to transform into a design. So we'll be adding that material in here. We had this vision that we would look across multiple industries that we would talk about maybe all our examples in the back and maybe we'd start with some templates, try and simplify this a little bit more. We're gonna sprinkle some examples throughout. We're not gonna try and do a major case study for this first release. What we're trying to do is give a visual of how to apply. I probably will not try and focus so much across different industries for this first release. We are just trying to get a product out that helps show how this could look. I personally, I know many of you might have as well, been doing this for many, many, many years. So it's very intuitive for me, but I appreciate that for many of the systems engineering community, it's not intuitive. And seeing examples and looking at different ways to ask the questions helps them. So we're gonna be infusing a little bit more of that into it. Now we're gonna to get to how, how are we gonna infuse that? So the approach to the guide, this particular guidelines expanding upon the input process and output diagrams, the IPO diagrams in the manual. I love those diagrams. When Lou started infusing that into the manual, the, the picture, which I've got on the next page, really brought uh, to life for me all the interrelationships of activities, the things you need to go get the things you know you're putting out and the stuff you need to do to make that happen. What Kevin had envisioned is this guideline can really speak to that stuff you need to do. And so he really speaks to the IPO diagrams uh, very specifically in the guide. He then offers procedural steps, step one, step two, step three. That might work. Another way we could do this is more of a table or a series of checklists. So I think I'm gonna play with some visuals on this. The, the guide as it looks now has nice steps delineated, but the narrative, I think in my opinion, can get a little lost. And those steps don't become very crisp and tangent anymore. The guide did start out a little bit more as a general narrative, a whole bunch of great things you need to do. And as Lou mentioned, a lot of that ended up getting put into the manual. So what we're gonna do now is convert the guide to a series of steps that speaks to the IPO. So this is kind of a concept slide here for you. I don't expect you to read this IPO. Please go pull up the manual if you want to see them. But the idea here is you've got what are your inputs you need to go collect. It may not be an exhaustive list, but it certainly are some key items. What are the things that will enable your process? What are the things you're expected to come out and produce? And then what are the things you need to do to actually make that happen? And this is where we're going to focus the guide, which then comes out to these series of steps. And then what Kevin had did is he had started writing step one, step two, step three. These are the series of things you need to ask yourself. These are the things you need to go do. Go, maybe go get a tool, start understanding your stakeholders. And then here's examples of what your outputs could look like. And in this case, a set of need statements associated with copy. So my observations and questions this is actually my last slide. This is a little bit of the forward work that I envision as well. I think this guy's in a transformation stage. I don't think what you're seeing on the Connect site at all reflects the finished product. I think, again, look at it as a concept. I don't know that it reads well right now. When I go through it, it's a bit clunky, even in the areas I just showed you. And I think what I vision is when someone opens this guide, it's very easy to find out how to develop need statements, how to manage them, how that gets converted to requirements and how to manage those. And then ultimately how to ensure quality and validity for all of those items. I want it to be very easy to find. I want examples and I want crisp one, step two, step threes, and I don't want it to be industry specific. It'd like it to be generic enough that if you're a student in the medical device field, in the oil and gas field, in aerospace, these steps resonate with you. Some may not apply, 
Some may apply more than others. I want to continue the coffee examples. We had a really good session yesterday about how useful some folks found the examples and how we do need to make them general enough. We're going to sprinkle them in. I'm not going to do a full case study end to end, but I do think showing a requirement traceability concept using coffee is something that's general enough. I think it would be useful to show. I do think we have all our contributor information still on the SharePoint site for the guide. I'm going to cull through those just to make sure not everything got moved to the manual that would be useful for a guide. Some things in there might still be useful to pull out. Ultimately for the team, before I go too far into this direction, what I wanted to use today's discussion for is the concept of pres presenting the material. So that was my last slide. This is going to now be a little bit more of a free form discussion because I definitely want to hear from those of you who have a lot of thoughts on how this could come out and what's worked well for you in other guidelines you might have followed. Hopefully anyone's brave enough to dive right in and unmute and, and share some thoughts with us. So Tammy, this is Ron Carson. I'll start. I want to revisit a question I asked two years ago, which is, do we really want to put requirements development and requirements management in the same document. The CMMI separates those. They're two different processes. And one of the reasons we have a clunky title is we've combined those into the, into the same document. And would we benefit and benefit our stakeholders by separating development for management because they are two very different processes. Very intriguing point, Ron. One wonders uh, with the interrelationships between as you develop it, where you put it. What would be your concept on how you handle that? What would be my concept on as yeah. you develop it, how you handle it? Mm -hmm. I can picture that's part of the management activities. So I want to just understand in your vision how this material could potentially point to each other or... Well, okay. So if we use the IPO concept, the output of developing requirements are individual requirements, sets of requirements, and the validation artifacts associated with those, the quality measures, traceability back to where it came from. That's the result. How that gets captured, a lot of people do it in Excel. People still do it in Word. Those who have money can go buy doors and other expensive tools, and they can capture it there. So that is going to be an organizational choice, quote, how to capture it. Uh, but that doesn't, how you capture it doesn't take away from what it is that you are capturing. One of the problems I've observed in industry over the last 30 years, we got so focused on requirements management that we did a great job of configuration, managing, and tracing garbage, but we're doing a great job on that. I'd rather have a guide devoted to development because that's where I think the real need is. The tools and the guidance available for tools about managing requirements, we got plenty of that. Oh, Ron, no, we don't. I, and I don't mean to be contrary. What I'm saying is I literally have spent the last three years researching what material is out there for developing, uh, and, well, actually managing requirements, very specifically. I was looking for managing requirements. There's no textbooks. There's there's very little material out there. I was just shocked compared to developing requirements and elicitation. Just the scope was quite praising to me. I'm not saying your point is invalid. I'm just noting that there is not a lot of material out there on managing requirements. Be that as it may, I still think the uh, CMMI had a good point in separating those process areas and if part of our intent is to support organizational maturation, then it's not a bad idea to align with the CMMI. Hey, Ron, one thing we have to do is align with 15.288 in the Nkosi System Engineering Handbook and not necessarily CMMI. But I do agree with you very much that management is a separate area. One thing CMMI doesn't do is they don't split out needs and requirements. They boil yeah. that into one thing. And so that results in people focusing just on requirements and verification. Yeah, I'm not trying to say the CMMI is the be all and the end all, but 15288 does split up requirements development from requirements management. No, it doesn't. It doesn't have requirements management. Oh, it's yeah. Split. It's down there under configuration management where it belongs. No, it's under about eight different technical management processes. It's okay. So the, a benefit of a separate requirements management guide could be to synthesize all those disparate processes identified in 15288 and 
enable that to be accessible. And I agree. And so in the manual, I do an assessment of all the different processes, CMI, PMI, uh, NASA, because NASA has a separate management process for requirements. I have a separate chapter in the manual. I'm still okay. working on it. I'm actually combining needs, requirements, and verification validation under one management umbrella because they're so tightly dependent and linked. Sure. And I think that makes all kinds of sense. I just want to split development for management because where I came from, management got all the attention and the content of what was being managed got almost no attention. What is the scope of management versus the scope of development? How would you break those two up? Uh, well, I'll defer to the CMMI on how it's split up. But basically, in my mind, development, especially given that we have a guide for writing requirements, which is throws a wrinkle in this whole thing because the writing is the last step, but the development is the technical content and that does include traceability to source. And management is primarily configuration management and allocations. And yes, it's going to involve traceability and version control, but it's primarily based on configuration management. Uh, it's instructive to recall that one of the very first process areas addressed by the software CMM was configuration management, software configuration management just so that everybody could be sure that the software people were writing code to the correct set of requirements. That was one of the original high uh, emphasis areas for software development in the software CMM was configuration management because they were doing a horrible job at it. Not the development of the requirement, but the actual management. Where would you put uh, variant control? You have a product that has different variants, say like an automotive that is got a European variant versus a U.S. variant. Where would you put that in management or development? I'd probably put that in management. Okay. It's probably in both. I like the way that NASA defines the management piece. One is the difference is management is the oversight of the activities that are being done by the engineering team. Management starts at the first day, so management is going to make sure that you have a process for developing needs and requirements. It's going to make sure that you have the tools, the people are trained. That's part of the oversight piece of it. The three main functions of requirement management that NASA points out is one is you're managing the development process, you're managing change, that's the configuration management part, but you're also managing the allocation budgeting and of the requirements and traceability for completeness and, and traceability aids in change control, but managing the allocation budget and traceability does a lot more than just configuration management. In section 14, I'm gonna focus on all of those different aspects of management. What about metrics, Lou? Do you cover metrics in that section? Yes, metrics is a key key thing. Metrics actually comes through the whole life cycle. So part of the development at the very beginning, when management defines problem, they're going to have measures of suitability that they're going to define. So there's a responsibility of those being met. And that's how they're measuring success. But also in the guide for writing requirements uh, and on the manual, we make a big thing about attributes that are defined for the needs and requirements. With the, today's modern tools, we can build dashboards. And so if, if the attributes filled out right, we can measure what requirements are critical, which ones have been implemented, which requirements have been verified and validated, and I mean the quality of the requirements. There's a lot of different metrics that you can collect because of the attributes that allow management to oversee that whole process. And one thing I've come to realize is a lot of times the tool vendors try to sell their tools to the developers. And I'm thinking that in order for management to hold the pulse for the oversight of the require, needs and requirements in the whole system engineering process, they need data. So if you can sell the tool to the management and say, this tool will allow you to track the progress of your project, thinking of needs and requirements as just part of the overall system engineering project, then with all those measures that you define ahead of time, the project manager will be able to come in and pull up a dashboard and be able to see just what his issues are, her issues are, what the status of the needs and requirements are, what the status of the design is, and meeting those. If you're in system verification validation, what's the status of that? So measures is so important. I think in the Kosi store, there's like five different 
documents just on measures. And so in the manual, there's a big focus um, on that throughout. And we're starting to do requirements metrics in our monthly reporting up the chain. A, a lot of what you're saying is basically what we're doing. So hopefully I'll be able to provide good feedback to the guide in that respect. The other thing is that requirements management to me is like the overall shell of of the requirements project and development is a piece of that. So I think the development should fit within the management. So maybe we just call a thing requirements management, but focus heavily on the development section. I'd rather call it requirements engineering than call it requirements management because I have had years of trouble with project management, believing all there is to requirements is copy, paste, and configuration manage, and put some trace links in, and you're done. And, and I, I like that. It, How about the, the guide for requirements engineering? Yeah, That's, I like that I, term engineering. Then we have to throw in needs, though. So for needs and requirements engineering, I don't think it's any shorter, but I can go with requirements engineering to include, encompass, and subsume both development and management if the consensus is we want to keep everything in a single guide. And how about the guide for needs transformation and requirements engineering? That's a great title, but it's a mouthful. Way I too long. I, 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 I didn't put the acronym together yet. Okay, well, let's come up with the acronym and then you know, come up with a word. and then. We'll oh, okay. I, I don't think we need needs in there because to me, requirements are the outputs of what you're trying to get from the customer. And we're going to spend a lot of time on developing needs, but I don't necessarily think it needs to be part of the, of the title. I don't want to downplay it. I mean, that needs are very important, but I think, you know, most people understand requirements and what they mean to a project. We have requirements engineering, unless we really want to transform the whole thing into, you know, needs development and requirements development and specification development. You know, I think we just leave it generically at requirements. Good afternoon. I think that the needs, it's really a translation of needs into the requirements. So you get your needs statement. So I do see the value of having uh, needs identified and definitely concur with the requirements engineering. There is something that happens transformational between those two words, right? And words matter. I see in that you have your needs identification or needs translation to requirements engineering, acknowledging that there's a difference between someone stating an, an entity or an actor stating a need and an actor fulfilling a requirement to address a need, there are two separate perspectives. I agree with that. And that's one reason why we're doing this. One of the problems that we have is in the past, the focus is so much on requirements. And because of that, the focus was so much on verifying the system meets those requirements as a condition for satisfying a contract. Jim Armstrong wrote a paper several years ago about that's not really the point. The point is making the customer happy. The point is, have we really developed a system that meets its intended purpose in its operational environment by its intended users? And that's all defined in the needs. In the presentation I gave yesterday, I said, what's more important, system validation or system verification? And in reality, system validation, you can make an argument, is actually more important than system verification. So that's one of the reasons why we're adding this emphasis on needs so that it's not overlooked like it's been done in the past. So the 20th so, century practice so, so Luke, so, done that. So Luke, can we make sure that we don't get in our own way here, right? I, I actually like that the document focuses a lot on needs and how they drive requirements, but does it need to be in the title? The, the ultimate output is going to be the requirements. Gathering the needs is a huge activity and it's a requirement to get solid requirements. And it's important that people understand that. I'm just wondering if we take it out of the title, but there's still a huge focus of it throughout the document. So in other words, needs are not the goal of this exercise, even though they're an integral part of it. Absolutely. Right. They're, they're huge on input, but they're not, the, the ultimate output is not the needs. The, the ultimate output is the requirements. But needs are important to get there. Isn't that correct? Yeah. Well, so I think yes. that was the point I was trying to make is that I think the needs are more important than the requirements because that's what I'm going to validate the system against. Well, I, I Lou, think. You're, you, I, think, I think both perspectives are right. We have to remember there's different stakeholders. Ultimately, as good systems engineers, we want to deliver product that meets the needs of the users and operators and maintainers. On the other hand, another class of stakeholders called project managers really only care about satisfying the contract. And for them, verification is the only thing that matters. 
we cannot lose that perspective. We can't just put on our idealistic system engineering hat and say, well, yeah, we're, we're there for the user and stakeholder and forget about the project manager that's paying our salary and wants to make sure verification is done. So let's not overemphasize validation with respect to verification. Both are required. That viewpoint is important whenever I'm going to contract out a system, which is a big thing about government developed systems. But like you go into an organization that's doing everything in-house, like SpaceX, they're interested not in verification, they're interested in validation. Did my rocket fly and work? Did it get the payload in space? That's what the stakeholders, the customers want, is that final thing. And they don't care about the requirements anymore. So there's a trend toward, you know, if you have heavily contracted products and the contract is written such that success of the contract is just requirements, then you're totally right. But I could develop a system to the requirements and have that system fail system validation. Of Um, course, that's all the time. That's what the commercial marketplace is. But that doesn't diminish the importance of requirements and verification. So let me ask a question, Lou, because I understand your point, but I still stand by what I said. So I agree that the needs report, if you don't understand what the customer wants, if you don't understand the customer's real problem to be solved, you're going to design the wrong product. But what if we get the needs perfect and we screw up the requirements? then I'm going to design to the requirements. I'm going to check them to the needs and I'm still going to be wrong. So I would say ultimately the the team that's developing the product or or solution is the requirements, what's going to drive those. So if if the document, the, the fact that the document focuses so much on gathering needs to develop successful requirements is huge. And that, that mindset needs to change. I agree. I think many of us have done that for years, but I love that it's moving that way. I just still don't know that needs needs to be in the title of the doc. That's all I'm saying. I'm not taking away the focus of what we're developing, but ultimately the, the team is developing a product to requirements that should thoroughly reflect the needs. They're not developing it to the needs. Let me say another way. One of the big challenges in corporate America is getting budget to actually develop requirements, not just copy and paste and change the name of the, of the actor. If we start saying, oh, and we have another process to instantiate needs before we get to requirements. Heck, I couldn't get any budget to do functional analysis or operational analysis. I'm going to go back and ask for budget to do needs documentation. Maybe in some areas that's realistic, but in the corporate America from which I came, it was hard to get anything more than budget to put requirements into a database and apply traceability. The more processes we lay on top of this, the less likely it will be to get implemented because somebody's going to have to go argue for budget to do the activity. And I agree. Can I, can I, inject, can I inject a that. thought real quick? Can I, I do want to inject this one thought, right? Somebody pointed out earlier that we as systems engineers work, tend generally to work for a project manager who pays our salary. And so we are on a project and that project has a scope. And at least in my industry, you guys can tell me if you have a different experience in your respective industries, okay? But in my industry, what generally happens is that that project will proceed. It'll go down the left side of the V and it'll go back up the right side of the V and it will be done. And at that point, if there is some validation exercise that leads us to understand that we screwed up, that we did not meet some needs, there will be a new project stood up to address that issue. It won't really be the same project that's addressing that failure. It'll be called something else and it will have a new project office and a new name. And that's my experience in my industry. And so for that reason, I think maybe there's some folks on here who share that experience. And um, and maybe that's where that perspective is coming from, that we as members of a specific project with a project scope and a project manager boss, we are be, we care the most about requirements. Needs are explored at something of a higher level that kind of floats across projects. And that's my two cents. That's the thought I wanted to inject. The issue here is that this whole subject of needs development is relatively new to industry in terms of a formal process. And I agree with Ron that getting budget for things like this is going to be difficult, but having it documented in an ENCOSI manual will give it more legitimacy and it will hopefully start a revolution of people thinking, you know what, this is a good idea. Not only do we need to get the 
the, the needs correct to begin with, we've got to validate that it's actually what they need. Okay, and then we follow the process every step of the way. We have our little triads throughout each part of the life cycle through the development of requirements. And it's a starting point. I think getting budget for a lot of these things, I mean, heck, it's hard to get budget for doing requirements engineering these days because everybody's on the cheap. But we've shown over and over that if you don't do the requirements right, you're going to spend a lot more money. And that needs to be the underlying theme of these products is that these don't cost money, they save money. And I think one of the biggest problems we have is process and tools. So the processes are the first step. Maybe at some time the, the RWG will start looking at developing tools that will help implement these things a lot easier. For example, the guide for writing requirements. There's been at least one that I know of organization that has taken the, the rules from the guide for writing requirements and implemented them in software. I've been trying to get that tool in my company for a long time. I get close and then I run out of time and I can't get it right to fruition. But at some point I will make that happen. And I think people are afraid to do requirements because it's difficult to write requirements. But if you've got a tool that's helping you every step of the way, people will get better at it where they won't even need the tool anymore. But it's it's a lot of training and requirements aren't sexy. So people aren't really drawn to them. But you know, I think it's a process that you have to start with legitimizing, getting standards, and then hopefully that sells into the organization and then it can be augmented with tools to grow. I mean, I think that's our vision for what we want with these tools. And maybe it needs to be part of the 3035 uh, vision as well. I'm going to be looking at that later. But if you agree with me, let me know. If not, you know, I'd like to hear differing opinions. Hey, Rick, I'm struggling to hear you still. Uh, could you just give me the quick soundbite of what you asked for? Because I want to make sure I took it away correctly. Right now, industry doesn't really understand the needs. And people are saying that, well, that's really not an engineering function because it's done at the business level. But what we're trying to do is bring engineering into the business level. I didn't really say that before, but it's kind of what I was alluding to. And so by legitimizing the needs development and the validation and verification of those needs, we are basically pitching that to corporate America and defense to make sure they see it as important and maybe they'll start funding it. Because Ron was saying, and I agree with him, very difficult to get funding for just requirements development as opposed to needs development. But I think the guides will help legitimize this and it'll start a groundswell. It may take decades for this to really take hold, hopefully not, but it'll eventually get there. And then the vision is that not only do we have the process, but we're going to need tools to make it easier to do. The biggest reason people don't do requirements engineering other than it's not sexy is that it's hard to do. It takes a lot of training. It takes a lot of discipline. Uh, and the guide is great, but you have to refer to the guide all the time. Having a tool like what the reuse company did with the guide for writing requirements really helps things. It, it makes people experts almost immediately. I mean, it takes a little bit of training, but those tools guide you as you're writing the requirement, telling you you're making mistakes along the way. And it also gives you quality for those requirements. Well, as I said, I was trying to get this tool into Harris, uh, L3 Harris, and I will eventually succeed. I've just been so busy lately. Uh, kind of pandemic threw us into a tailspin and working from remote's not been the easiest thing in the world, but it's starting to get better. Thank so what you, I'm Greg. looking for is keep going okay. with these tools. And then eventually, once we get through this round, we look at starting another initiative for developing tools or a standard for tools that can help companies realize the guides that we're working so hard on to be able to be used without extensive training and having subject matter experts. That's all they do. Because honestly, in my company, we might have two or three people that are that good. And everybody goes to them when they want requirements. And it's a bottleneck. But if we had tools, it wouldn't be a bottleneck. And the quality requirements would not only get better, but it would be able to be tracked and measured. Thank you, Rick. I appreciate you restating that. Uh, we had someone patiently waiting with their hand raised too. I want to give him a chance. I, I hope I say it right. It's Francesco. Good morning. Good evening to everyone. I have a comment and a question. Comment is that uh, I think it's part of INCO's mission to promote systems engineering to all or, or many application domains. So I think everything we are producing should be very general. It should be more focused on principles that later can be tailored by domain experts. So domain experts should shape these processes to fit better the environment where they operate. So one of my concern is always to standardize as much as possible 
uh, terminology and also best practices to keep them general to be shared? And this is the question. I wonder if you are moving away from the, the terminology used in the Systems Engineering Handbook version 4 and also from ISO 15288, where we have uh, needs and requirements uh, definition process. And if you look to that uh, IPO diagram inside, you can see verbs like uh, manage, develop, uh, transform. So uh, all the verbs that has been mentioned in these discussions are there, but uh, at least between the handbook and the ISO standard, there is consistency. And I also do not like very much the discussion about uh, giving more priority to needs or requirements. I think it, it depends on the domain. In my domain, I'm working in scientific domain, needs are more important, but I would never say that in general they are more important. It depends on the situation, and uh, both are important and should be tailored depending on the situation. I appreciate you weighing in. Honestly, one of the things that I want to do is acknowledge we have multiple industries here in multiple types of practitioners. So I really appreciate you advocating for that. One area I also want to do is make sure we don't always assume what we're seeing in our careers or our industries is reflective of a, of a broader community. That's why I love this interaction we're doing now is to get all these voices heard. Um, Lou might have some concepts related to the alignment with the handbook and the standard because we've been actually actively looking into that. And I was hoping, Lou, if you could weigh into the work you're doing to infuse the terms and the concepts across those broader documentation. For those that didn't see the presentation yesterday, the manual has excerpts from the current Nicosia System Intern Handbook spread out through the manual showing that what's in the manual is consistent with what's in the system manager and handbook 15288. There's a few terminology issues as far as naming processes that are currently in 15288 that we're working with the editors. And when I say me, Mike Ryan and I have been working with them to address those issues. Like there's a figure that talks about technical processes in 15288 that's organizational levels and they have a strategic level, they have a operational level and a system level. And at the operational level, they talk about stakeholder needs and requirements. At the system level, they talk about the, the process name is system requirements development. But yet at each level in the diagram, there's lifecycle concepts, needs and requirements. So we're trying to get that fixed a little bit so that it says operational stakeholder needs and requirements or operational needs and requirements, just like the the level above is business needs and requirements. So they could just say operational needs and requirements. And then at the system level, say system needs and requirements to better communicate what's going on. Mike, Ryan, and I are writing the new updates, to the handbook version five. So all the, the stakeholder needs and requirements section, the system requirements section, the B&B section, the interface management section, we were writing that. The words and terminology in there are being used to influence what's going into 15288 and everything in the write-ups for the new handbook are basically a summary of what's in the manual. So that gives us a lot of alignment. Thank you all for really, really good discussions. What I want to do is highlight uh, some takeaways that I got in this discussion. And we still have more discussion we can have, but I wanted to kind of to use this as a sync up opportunity. I got plenty of name recommendations. I actually want to filter through all the chat and we go through conceptually what I've heard is some advocacy on whether we should stick with the needs focus or not. In a way, I want to digest a lot of what I heard before we pick a path, but I liked hearing the different perspectives. There is a lot of concern about what could be funded, what could be practical. And my original impression is we could advocate for processes that are really good processes to do. But it's on an organization to decide whether those processes really apply to what they're trying to achieve. So I don't want to omit something just because some people are, are worried we're adding to essentially a workload. We want to allow for what I think Francesco said, which is some people really want to develop and spend some time understanding the needs for the products they're working on. Whereas others are going to be doing a little bit more of that maybe product line, we've done this before, we, we're going to start with what we've done before. So there's going to be some different approaches. But I took a lot of notes. I've got some ideas on names. There is this hope that I could have, which is what resonates with you in a guide and how we can present the material and tie to the manual. And for the 30 minutes I have left for the guide discussion, that would be the most useful for me. After that, it's an open forum. We, we could continue doing 
exactly what we were doing for the last half hour and have that exchange of focus areas and things we should remember to include or things that concern you. But can I just ask for perhaps a few minutes discussion on concepts of what I presented for using the IPO, using a procedural set of steps, and whether folks uh, resonate with that or they prefer a little bit different type of approach, maybe something they've seen in that. So, Tammy, I, I, I think the guide approach you're talking about with the IPO is fine, but clearly it has to go beyond what's already in 15288. So it has to be more granular, more detailed in terms of the level of detail. But for Matt, if it aligns with the SE handbook, I think that's great because that speaks to unity, unification, and a common format is going to be much more accessible. So when we refer folks from one document to another, they say, oh, I know how to get into this because I've seen this format before. Directional connection from 15288 to the guide and so forth. If it's a common format, it's just easier to access. IPO is fine. Tammy, can I say something? Yeah, I'm sorry. Can you identify yourself? I'm, I'm... Oh, it's Bill Bearden. Hey, Bill. Thank you. Go ahead. First. I'm sorry. I'm listening to Ron. I, I think people put too much emphasis on 15288. 15288 is life cycle processes. It's a whole suite. I mean, there's a ton of processes in there. I can't remember how many there are. Requirements related processes, right now there's actually three. What I call the real heart of technical design is really more like five or maybe six because architecture and design are in there. And the architecture people, I mean, right now in the ISO world, I mean, I'm a co-editor on 15288 and I'm the working group chair. So I have to deal with all of it. The details, the guides, that are being considered by the RWG, I think are very important. And they are supposed to be a lower level. They don't have to tie directly to things like 15 to 88. They should kind of be related. They should kind of fit, but they don't have to be tightly coupled. I mean, even in ISO, we wrote 29148. I've been watching the chat. I mean, there are people that like the term requirements engineering, and there's some that don't. It was a title that we were given, and we published it. But that's an elaboration of simply the requirements-related processes. But it still doesn't capture the whole picture because there's a whole other group of people out there in architecture and design that are also feeding things back into this whole process. We requirements engineers can't do it all. It's still a team effort. It's still a system engineering effort. Don't worry about 15288 so much. There's other places we need to worry about 15288, and Lou's got that one figured out. I just think it's important that if we're publishing a guide as a Incosi requirements working group, all the content should be traceable to the Incosi SE handbook. There's things in the Incosi SE handbook, and then you take one step further and you go to the system engineering book of knowledge. Gary Rodler and I were talking about this the other day. It's like the SE handbook is kind of like what we would call accepted state of the practice might be the, a way of looking at it where SE handbook, there's a lot of things going out there in the world and I mean, models are really coming along and we don't have nearly enough addressing models and how well they're supporting the effort of design and development and production. Well, I'm not saying we can't go beyond what's in the handbook, but the framework of what we're talking about should not be at variance with the existing published information. Otherwise, we just confuse people. Sure. I Okay. I mean, right now, even in the old version of 15288, there was a place when we added what's currently called business or mission analysis. That was where the whole concept of the front end assessment and from the old days when Lou used to teach me requirements, the needs, goals, objectives of a an entity, call it an organization, call it a business, call it whatever, that development process, that analysis, assessment, looking at what people want, what are we trying to do was instantiated mostly within that process. And it wasn't perfect. It was the first time it came out and it's being addressed again in the revision. I mean, we have a 15 to revision going on and we have an SE handbook revision going on and yes we are trying to align the two of them. All right just for the format discussion because then I'll make this go away. It sounds like there's not a big concern with the way I'm approaching the format. 
definitely, we're going to make sure our, our material synergized. That's part of the content discussion. But from a format, I feel comfortable with this approach and I'm going to go ahead and try and, and keep maturing this a little further. So we can go back to the content and scope discussion and I'm really appreciating all the chat as well. I'm capturing a lot of those notes. It is very important to know this is a moving target. Our handbook and the ISO standard are being updated as we speak. We have people on those groups helping the synergizing of the concepts so that we are not completely disconnected the minute our products come out. But there is this potential that things are happening concurrently and slightly outpacing each other. And we will have to adjust. Uh, Rick noted, we update our, our guidelines as that occurs. These will be updated. This is not an only one-time release. We will keep maturing these, uh, these products. Related to the guide, before we open up a more broad discussion for all of our products, is there anything anyone wants to ensure I think about as we start this? I, and I haven't even taken off the table whether we split it or not. I mean, that's definitely something we're going to talk about as we, we think of the logistics. So Tammy, thank you for that. Two years ago when these were started, there was much discussion and about what the outlines should be. And the requirements working group basically approved the outlines. And now those things seem to evolve. And before you get heavy into reworking all the content, I would like to have a chance to look at the new outlines so that we can be confident where what is getting written to is really the scope of what we want covered. And, are, and people are in agreement that it makes all kinds of sense. Rather than not just either copying material or restructural, but since we're doing such a major revision, I think we owe it to ourselves to take another objective look at the outline, however you want to conceive it, whether it's one guide or two guides, but have a chance to look at that and then bounce that, of course, against Lou's document, the lifecycle manual, and make sure everything's covered and nothing fell off the table or got lost before there's another big commitment to writing. I hate rework. Ron, when you look at the evolution of this, in the beginning, like Tammy said, there was no manual. They're just the two guides. And so the initial outlines for those two guides were developed under that assumption. But as things evolved, there was a need for a lot of the, the more detailed concept kind of stuff to be somewhere else other than the guides. Then those outlines become a mute point. They didn't really apply anymore because the guides were now going to be something different than the original intent when those outlines were made. So that overall outline of materials and stuff is really now covered in the manual. And so now the guides are going to be a, I don't know what the, the right word is, Tammy. What did you, it's kind of like a kind of- instructions at one point, but I think what yeah. Don McNally wrote in the chat really is pertinent to this discussion. The organization of this document should align with the organization of, well, Lou's document, but the manual. Um, it, it, and that's it, Ron. I mean, I'm not going to do a lot of creative writing exercises in this guideline. This is 100% an alignment activity with the manual and doing a work instruction concept of how to apply those uh, process steps. Okay. I have a fun thought that it's a little bit of a of a swerve, but I just figured it might be fun to inject here. I want to bring up model-based systems engineering. And model-based systems engineering is something that we haven't really talked about a whole lot in these meetings. And a lot of folks are going to just immediately say, well, that's kind of a separate discipline. A lot of folks see model-based systems engineering as something that you do after requirements have been developed. I got to tell you, I do not see it that way. I believe that the whole, you know, fundamental tenet of model-based systems engineering is that you base your systems engineering, including needs and requirements development on a model. Without a model first existing, you cannot base anything on it. The manual is written with that in mind. And in fact, what you just described is kind of a foundation for the manual. That's great. And I wanted to highlight that. I wanted to continue that trend. I'm actually interested in seeing further development along that to further emphasize that. But thank you. End of injection. Let me give you a moment there. Um, John, you're the one that reached out to me and said you'd love to be a conduit between the right. working group and the M MBSC community. And I think that's highly important as a practitioner myself, I know that a lot of my needs and requirements start with that model. And that isn't well known, right? That isn't a common practice everywhere. Different groups are different maturity stages there. Lou did do justice to the concept of data-driven 
model-driven decision-making in the manual. But we certainly could use your practiced eye to look at it and say, are we really communicating the things we're hoping to as an MBSE practitioner? That's one area I could use some support. The second area is um, I'm not going to marry us to any tool or any specific practice of language, but the infusion of the idea we're data-driven and model-based is very important. But I also need people out in the MBSE communities to understand what we're trying to do with their models. <laughs> and so as we have folks attending the MBSE workshops and the various uh, exchanges, I'd love membership from the requirements working group to really understand what's going on with these models, how people are advocating usage of them. We might find they're advocating usage away from principles and fundamentals we're trying to go towards in how to use these models. So that's the interchange and, and the representation I think we could really use in that community. I had an idea when we were talking about the real big picture plan, we have the manual, which is giving you the practical day-to-day -day information to to help develop needs and requirements and plan for and conduct system verification and validation. The manuals go into a lot more detail, but in the, the needs definition part, the section on life cycle uh, analysis and maturation, I show some diagrams that anyone could develop in PowerPoint, better if you have a modeling tool to use that. And then the re needs and requirements are an outgrowth of the modeling. But I don't go into any detail on the nuances on modeling. You know, we talked about we have the guide for writing requirements and we're developing the guide for developing needs and requirements. And we may split that out into a managing one and the guide to V and V. But the intent is for domain specific guides that could be developed by different working groups that could tailor the concepts in the manual to a particular domain. But that could also go with modeling. If someone wanted to develop a guide to modeling in the context of the manual, that would be great because then you, you could focus right in that, just like there could be an agile perspective of implementing what's in the manual. So there could be a family of guides. Stepping up a layer, the new system engineering handbook approach is that they're advocating going to follow up what PMI did, but PMI had the PMBOK, and then they have supplements, like there's a PMI supplement to requirements, development, and management. So so in the new framework for the system engineering handbook, they are advocating that we have domain tailored implementations of the handbook. So there's going to be several layers where there's going to be a lot more domain specific tailoring. And so if I'm in product line development, how do I manage the requirements for different variants of a product and have a separate guide just for that? Uh, so we're kind of off the door in encouraging people both at the handbook level and at the manual level for different working groups to develop a guide themselves as long as there's consistency in terminology. So I think a few years ago, Sandy has been leading the, one of the leaders of MBSC and SysML said, you know, model-based systems engineering is systems engineering. So we have a good definition process. It flows naturally into whatever the tool is. My emphasis the last few years has been if you want to get improvement in requirements, especially in the area of model-based systems engineering of requirements, we have to get away from thinking of requirements as these sentences and start dealing with them as pieces of engineering. I have the actor, I have the function, I have the performance attribute, I have the condition, I have the trigger, and our MBSE tools have to evolve to support that. But we can't wait for that to happen to say that's the right thing to do. And I'm seeing that in the in the life cycle manual now. More attention to the specific elements of what I've called structured requirements in the past. And that's that's the way I think we should be going. And hopefully the tools in the MBSC uh, like SysML languages will catch up with that, but we can't wait for that, but we need to continue to promote that good aspect of requirements engineering. So, so. I'm going to jump in and say this one thing. I really don't think we need to wait for that because we are there. The tools today are flexible enough to include the kinds of connections between information that you need in order to characterize an ontology of needs or in order to characterize a system of systems from which you flow down requirements to a system level. Tools today are very capable of doing that. What we need are the fluency of language and the people willing to undertake that, uh, which is a little bit more rare, right? 
<laughs> for so, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I have used it in my career. I have used modern existing tools to great effect to actually model out ontologies of needs and to run discussions with stakeholders and then to write requirements from that. Um, I always tell my sponsors when I'm running those kinds of meetings, we're going to wait until we see the whites of their eyes to write requirements. You're going to be tempted to want to take pick up a pen and start writing down requirements, but don't do that. First, discuss the model. Make sure everybody agrees that this is your ontology of need, and then, then write requirements. And so I really do believe that we have the tools we need. They're not great yet. They could stand a lot of improvement, yes. And once we get the people and the tool fluency in our community, they will improve. Um, but we need to step with that and, and actually you know, see it and start incorporating it into our guidance. Um, and that's my thought on that. Hey, I want to do a logistics check. We're reaching the end of the time for the guideline discussion. We definitely are going to continue a discussion. What I'd like to do is allow everyone just a quick break. We're going to change our recording, and then we're just going to get rid of the slide, and we're going to what I call our Exchange Cafe format. And this is really then open season on any of the material, any of the directions RWG is doing, thoughts of things we should be focusing on throughout the year. Uh, but first, I just need to give ourselves a little break. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, pause us for five minutes, keep chatting if you want. We just won't be on the recording. And then I'll regroup us and we'll do our last session 